in M3. So also hello and welcome from my side. So I will, together with Daniel, we'll give you an introduction in math spectrometry. So we try to, yeah, to get all people to the same kind of knowledge, like on the same level that we all know in the end of the we do, what we need to be aware of. And if people are already experts, I hope this will also get you some ideas to go back and think about some stuff that you already think you know, but maybe there's something that is somewhere in your mind. Yeah. And also, yeah, it's very nice to see you all here, all together, and a big thank to all people that yeah, did all this stuff in the back, like the planning and everything. So thanks to Madeline, I think as well, and Mark and Daniel. So thank you. So so first of all, what's math technology and why is it so important? And one thing that we always need to keep in mind is that we measure ions, and this is very important to keep always in mind. We measure ions with quantum spectrometry, and this is why you can see the scale here. So if we use the compound that we have, and we compare it with this and all the mass that we have. So the mass to charge, we see it's like equal. And what does it mean with the mass to charge ratio? If we combine like as many carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, then we get to this. Chemical formula, which then if we if we um, compute it to the to the neutral mass, then it's like equal to the compound that we see on the left side as well. And here I want to highlight why mass spectrometry is so important, or that we already use it in so many different applications. So, for example, my group in Clark, we are working on uh, specialized plant metabolites, but they are also used working with microbes, with microbiome. And then, of course, we use it also as a quality control in schools or in the pharmaceutical industry as well. And what I think is pretty cool that we also use mass spectrometry in space. So we are not only limited on our Earth, but we also use it far away. And you see, like, how wide the field actually can be. And speaking about this, we always need to be aware of what we actually study or what is our sample or our question that we have or an issue. So we need to see what is the sample set that we have and what is actually what we want to see. So we want to compare, for example, human samples compared to environmental, or if you go a bit like smaller, we use like the farm kingdom versus the microbes, for example. And another thing is we need to keep always in mind what is actually our plan that we want to have. Do we want to quantify something? So for example, we have like a knockout study. Do we want to have like one compound that is not in any sample anymore? Or do we want to see something with upregulation or downregulation? Or is it only important that we want to have it in one sample and it's missing in another? So this is something we want to quantify or the qualification already we have. And then another thing, speaking about quantification, is like, is it targeted or non-targeted? I mean, with the uh, uh, research in the screen, not of screening, of course, it's a lot of also finding by a target or find a target for any disease. If you find the target in the end, of course, it's not targeted. But if you find something, then we can use it in a targeted way to search and see, like, this blood sample uh, as a targeted identification. And this is also something we need to keep in mind. Metabolomics is like a very already a specific field or small molecules, it's also sometimes called. So it's very already specific. So we are only focusing on a specific uh, field or yeah, the study. And then it's also very important which instruments we choose, what is the extraction method that we use. So we already kind of biased how we actually extract the samples and in the end how we actually um, yeah, analyze it or um, yeah, which instruments we actually use. And therefore, it's always very important to actually know what you are looking for. So if you something that is hydrophilic, then we'll see to some extraction that you actually extract your sample out, and then you just the like that, that actually helps you to identify it. If you can't detect it in the system, of course, it doesn't make any sense because you will miss it and then you will be like, oh, it's not there, but maybe it's just because of the instrument oh, and the setting. <laughs> and that's why it's always important there's no method that fits everything. So you always need to check what is actually my question, my research topic, and does this method actually fit what someone else maybe did in another paper, for example. And speaking about so many different stuff, so here's like a very easy setup what we can actually use as hypernation. So maybe I can ask around who use GPM for gas chromatography already, or maybe just in general, who use mass spectrometry in general. <laughs> How about GC? <laughs> 
And then, of course, something more specific is like imaging, who we'll use yeah. imaging techniques. Yeah. So, we see it like the people. Oh, that's interesting. I think all these types of people. So, we see we have different platforms that you can actually use. We see GC and LC are like the most prominent, I would say. And imaging is very specific, but it's also a very nice field. So, yeah, I also work a lot on imaging. So, I also like this topic as well. And so far, we are also not only limited in these three techniques, we also have the eye mobility dimension. Maybe who worked with IMS data already? I guess it's even less people. <laughs> well, it seems to be even more than imaging. It's be interesting. So, and this is also some additional dimension. And now we can also combine IMS. So it's not only an individual part, but we can combine it with liquid chromatography, or we can use like imaging as well and combined to IMS dimension, which is very nice because in imaging we don't have any separation because we only acquire like spatial on our sample. But with IMS we could add like a separation to actually separate based on the rest of our uh, as well. But I will not go too much into IMS because I think it's also uh, people use it less near the room as well. So what I want to make sure is you have seen so many different tools or hyphenation options and whatever, but in the end, if you see G C or L C, it's always for imaging. So we acquire mass spectrum in the end. So we have like MV compared to intensity. And of course we have some additional information based on the system that we use. But in the end, the first thing that you should be aware of is that the mass spectra are kind of the same. Again, you put like in the end retention time as a different identification dimension and separation. And in imaging, you have like the spatial detail images as well. But the first spectra are kind of the same idea. And speaking about so many separation techniques, it's like uh, with each technique, you have like advantages and disadvantages. Of course, with gas chromatography, you have like the boiling point as the identifier. And it's only possible for volatile compounds. For liquid chromatography, we are more for the polar side, I would say. And then again, we have the retention time that we can compare. With eye mobility, we add the dimension of the um, size and the gas shape, which is also very nice to, to have an additional identification dimension. And then, of course, we have the mass spectrometer to measure the mass charge, but to separate the ions based on their uh, mass charge ratio. And then you see here very easy way how to, to set up our system. We have our sample extraction system like LCGC. Then of course we need to ionize our compounds because we can only detect what we ionize. Or we can also transfer through the whole mass spectrometer what is ionized. So we can guide it based on the chart. And then we also have our ion analyzer of course we need to separate the ions right based on the mass and then we need to detect those um, ions in the end. And then in the end you can get like intensity and Z, which is like the most important step here. And then we can add retention time and the future for section based on the setup that we use. And again, this is just a very brief what we can get out of GC, LC, and uh, imaging techniques. Again, GC you can only use if the compounds are volatile. Of course, if you have something polar, you can use a derivation. Uh, reagent and then it's like also volatile but your compound needs to be a fair more stable in a way and then you need to be aware that in the ionization mode so you use electron impact we fragment most of our signals so in the end you need to know which is our like precursor ion but it's pretty hard to get to this so you need to decompose all your spectra to get an idea so mostly we see fragments maybe some and top and with HPLC, it's a softer ionization in this case with ESI. So here we see mostly M plus H or some other adduct like sodium, for example, or ammonium, depends what you also need in your um, software. And then we have MOLDI, which is a very nice technique that you can use your tissue sample, for example, and then you can analyze it directly on your thin section. Here the ionization is very is also soft, so you see also M plus H adduct. And maybe also other adducts depending on your metric that you have in your tissue itself. And I talked already a lot about LC, GC, and so on. And here I want to highlight what is the basic idea about chromatography. And it's just very brief. So in the past, a lot of people used, for example, thin layer chromatography. So what's the basic to separate to separate ions? 
and to separate compounds based on their interaction with the, with the stationary phase and with the mobile phase. And then we see nice in this uh, image here that we see based on the color of the compounds are having a different retention on the silica. This is also one how it actually looks like. So we see the solvent is going and then it's taking the compounds based on their interaction higher on the silica gel or lower. Another step to separate the compounds is you can liquid liquid extraction, for example. So it depends how is the, um, the um, yeah, what is the how is the um, yeah separation or how does it act in the lipophilic or in the hypophobic and uh, hypophilic way? So if you have an organic or water phase, how will it actually separate in your different phases? And then based on this, you can separate different compounds. Of course, you need to know where your compound will be in the end to get your compound in the end for the analysis. One might nice think, for example, if you have a compound that you can charge with a buffer, so you can first, uh, if it's like neutral, you can have it in the organic phase, you take the organic phase, then you take the buffer to change the pH in the water phase, then you charge it, and then it will be in the water phase, so you separate it from a lot of stuff based on this technique already. And then you have the solid liquid, or gas extraction is like basically liquid chromatography or gas chromatography. It's always the same. You have like a, a stationary phase and then a mobile phase, and then based on this affinity where it will stay longer, you will see a separation from the compounds in the end. This is just a very brief uh, summary. Of what yeah, what um, things you can actually separate or based on which um, setting or yeah from the compound itself. We see we have the full lighter action, we have the boiling point of the GC. We can also use size exclusion if we think about macromolecules, but this is very specific type that you can also use in, in LC and based on the column that you then use in the case. And normally we use like for most applications, I would say so we use a reverse phase chromatography. And then we have our uh, stationary phase with a uh, normally 18 um, uh, yeah, length. And then we see that we have one compound here in the lower compound has like more affinity to the stationary phase, so it's slower eluding from the column. And then we have the second compound, which has like an epoxy group, so it's more polar and has less interaction with the stationary phase, but more with the mobile phase. And then it's eluding faster than this one. We see the other one is already gone. And the lower one is still interacting and switching um, to a later time point to end up with a column. And this is just an example that there are more options. It's not only C18, I mean, C18 is still the most prominent one, I would say. Then you can sometimes see C8 is also used if you want less uh, hydrogen publicity, for example. And then we have venue and also like shield options up there. You always need to check what you actually want to have. If your separation bad, you can change, of course, the, the solvent gradient that you use, or you could also try to change the color and use something that might be useful to separate your compound. And then I already said, so you have a compound that is like uh, slower than the other. And if you want to get some ideas how actually, how good is our uh, separation itself. So we see here like this is completely extracted. And then we can use different parameters of this uh, chromatogram or yeah, this chromatogram to get an idea of our separation itself. So we have the retention factor. I don't want to go into too many details. I think, I mean, maybe both of you know it already or you can also the uh, readers later, but the important part is that you have like the highest point from your metagram for your ion, and then you always need to know what is your time that the injection was happening and everything that was not retained is like eluding out of your system. This is what we use with uh, T0 as well. And then you know everything that is not retained has a time of one minute, maybe it's a bit longer it's from one minute, and then you know okay, one minute is everything that is not retained in the system, and then everything else. Should stay longer, or you could like uh, check the retention factor. Then we have the selectivity factor where you actually compare two of these uh, retention factors. And then, of course, we have the resolution that we can use. And then here we just need to be aware that there are different, uh, different formulas that we can use. So we can use the half weight of the height and, and so on. And then we can get an idea about the resolution if we can separate two peaks that are close to each other, for example. And this is just again an example of how an actually a nice chromatogram can look like. Of course, the, the basic idea if we use this, for example, as a standard, and we have maybe five 
by compound, for example, and then we want to separate all reference compounds that we have, and then we see like here, like peaks, so we are good. And then of course, we have like a washing step, so where everything else is coming out of the system. But this is basically the idea that we want to have to separate all ions or as many ions as possible, and then get a nice measurement out of it. And one thing I want to highlight is in the past, we used GC as the this was the first method that we had. And the, the problem that we had in the past was how do we get the solvent phase into a gas phase, right? So it was a big issue. So it wasn't so easy to put like a liquid into our mass spectrometer. And this is why the electrospray ionization was developed. So here we actually dry the liquid that is coming from the column entering our system. So we have this uh, needle here. We have like different gases to dry it. We have a voltage. And then based on this, we get the charge and smaller droplets even evaporating even more, and then we get it into our aspect of the at the end. And then again, I want to highlight that based on the compound that we have, we have different ionization techniques. I talked about ESI before, but of course not every compound is easily ionizable with this. If you have something that is more non-polar, there's also the option to use atmospheric pressure chemical ionization. I think this is a very nice visualization how it can look like or what is the basic idea so if you have something small and one whole lot maybe it's volatile so we can be easy with it but if we have something larger and it's polar it's very promising that ESI might be good set up to use so coming to the mass spectrometer now so we spoke about the separation technique a very brief one about the ionization and then if we think about the MS so what do we get? The thing is what we always need to know is we get normally the mass spectrometer acquires the data in the profile mode, what you can see on the left side, which has a lot of data points. If you think about every mass has multiple data points based on this or based on the distribution. So the normal way is then to convert it to centroidic mode, or you could also set it already during the data acquisition. So the system will then already re where we calculate this into the centroidic mode. Of course, the problem is you can always miss something, I would say, if you already convert something before actually getting it. So it's always nice to get like the real raw data and then you do a centroiding afterwards. But here we see that for each mass, we basically have only one signal. And this is also something we need to be aware of. So this is showing something very nicely from an isotope pattern. So we see each signal here has the um, has the mass difference of 1.0034, for example. So we see different isotopes for each signal or for each compound that we have. And then, of course, we also get different adducts, maybe in source fragments. And this is also something we need to be aware of because if you think about you have some settings in your spray, you have like a high temperature. If you have pre compounds, it is very promising that you will leave it off and you will only see the aquicon in the end. But of course, if you do the, the annotation in the end, you will also go to this later. Then you need to be aware based on the settings you can already yeah, break your compound to smaller parts and you will use the original line as well. But just something here is what I want to highlight is that you get always like redundant information about one compound. So it's not only you get one signal, and that's good, but you get like multiple adducts, input fragments, and also either pattern, which is also nice because it also confirms a bit from your structure in the end, right? Because you get an idea, you see R to the F H, and that's the M to the only because you also see a signal and uh, this mark change. And something else that you very often see in proteomics or when you have macromolecules is that you see uh, multiple charged ions. In, in um, metabolomics, I think you mostly see doubly charged maybe, but in proteomics, you actually see like 14 charges. And what we here need to be aware of that we need to because it's always mass to charge ratio, so the charge is always also in this uh, hidden. So we need to then equally move the charge state based on this. So if we want to know the, the neutral mass from this signal, here, we need to multiply the 14, for example. And also, if you think about the isotope pattern, the isotope pattern will be also uh, yeah also changed. So if we go back to this slide here, where I said it's always 1.0034 for the C13 isotope pattern. If we have a double chart, of course, the isotope pattern will be shifted by divided by two, so it will be 0.5 as uh, again shifted, which is also a nice hint that you have a double charged ion in this case because you have the um, isotope pattern in this shifted way. And another thing is what is very important if we speak about mass spectrometers is that we have also this mass resolution from the 
from the mass side. So before I saw the property, we had like the resolution from the external house system. But here we have it from our uh, yeah, mass instrument. Okay. And this is something I just acquired for copying with our Orbitrap instrument. I could set like different resolution. And what we actually see is that we change the peak width of our signal. Of course, if we have something, there's nothing surrounding it, we don't have any issue with it. But if you have some um, ion closer to it, then it might be a problem. But we see that we also have like a shift from the uh, PPM value. Of course, if you have a wider peak, it's more harder to get to the highest weighted point. And then based on this, we get the uh, shift in the end. But we see with the orbital at least, and it was freshly calibrated, we see the PPM is still 1.5, so it's not that bad. If you think about the resolution, it's always, if you set it higher, your scan rate is like slower because you need more time to scan your ions. So this is also something uh, you need to be aware of. And I mean, in this case, there's nothing surrounding it or interfering with our company, which is not a problem. But if you look at this plot here, you see with different mass resolutions that at one point we get to this point where we can't easily separate the mass anymore, which is then a problem. And if you then think about that, you already convert your profile data to centroid data, maybe based on the centroiding algorithm, you will already combine some peaks that you will maybe in the profile you still see a separate one, but based on the algorithm in the end, you see only one. Maybe shift it and you think of something else, and that's why it's maybe sometimes good to have the profile mode. And I know that there's been a lot of discussion of how to handle profile because normally we use the acquired in profile, and then we already centered it, and then no one is checking the profile mode anymore, right? So, this is something I want to highlight that it's actually important to check if there's something with the mass resolution happening or if it's too slow. And yeah, Something else I also want to highlight in combination with the mass resolution, if you write a paper about it, how do you actually want to yeah, give the number or how accurate is your number? And this is something I really want to highlight. Even though your mass spectrometer says, oh, I have this number of digits acquired. Is it really true? So if you have something with low, res with low resolution, you can't just use any digits that the system is saying. So you should be aware that your accuracy is not that high. So maybe you can say like one digit. If you have done a Q-top, which is already a bit higher in the resolution, you can add like two digits more with Orbitrap, again more. And then if you go to FDICR, for example, you can even add more. But this is something you need to be aware of. Even the system says five digit and it's a triple, triple quadruple, maybe check it and see if it's it's actually true, and then just use some less digits in the end of it. Okay. And this is just a very brief overview of which different systems we have and what is actually important. And maybe some people are like, oh, we only have a triple cross or a Q top. I always want an orbit trap. I mean, every system has their advantage, disadvantage. I would always, of course, you're limited to the system that you can have in your lab. And again, it, it also is good and it's good enough to go with your sample. I mean, of course, you need to see what you're actually looking for. Maybe a collaboration partner has the system. It's something that is most of the time also very nice. If you do like a method development, you can use a system that is maybe less frequently used. At least it was an hour old lab like this. So all people wanted to use the new machine. But maybe especially for method development, I think it's still nice to use the machine that is maybe not so occupied, you can do the method development, and then maybe if you want to pay, have a paper out of it, you can switch and have the real samples running on the system in the end. So what I want to highlight is that, yeah, each system, of course, has a different price, which is also important. If you use the Q-top, it's pretty fast and scanning, so it's very nice to acquire a lot of that scan. It is very good for the targeted analysis or the accuracy, and you have a very high linear range. But if you go to Orbiter, for example, of course, it's more accurate. But if you compare it to the scanning speed, it's like pretty slow compared to the Q-top. So this is something you need to be aware of in the end. And speaking about this, this is also a slide some people already knew, maybe. So it's like, if you think about the mass spectrometer, everyone has their disadvantage and advantage. It's like if you compare it with the Pokemon cards here, you have like different resolution, accuracy, sensitivities. And speed and of course the cost so that every lab can handle to buy this nice new machine for millions of dollars, whatever to buy. So this is also something you need to keep in mind. So coming to the more characteristics now. So I want to speak about some mass analyzers. So we have the quadrupole, which is very nice, I think. So what you need to be aware of is quadrupole. So in the name, you already have that we have four electrodes. 
and then always the opposite side has the same charge. And then based on this, we can actually move the ions in this particle time. Yeah, in this particle system, which is also very important. Again, ions we can we can move or we can maneuver through this way. But if we have some neutral ion, of course, we can't do anything. So we can just go on, which is also nice because later the detector can't differentiate between neutral ions, whatever. So it's good that we uh, can actually guide then ions through this path and get only the ions from the market charge ratio of the actual material. So this is how it then works. So we have our positive charge ion here, for example, it's attracted by the minus uh, charge. And then again, we switch the, the, the polarities and then it's like happening in a specific frequency. And based on this, we can actually keep the ions on the, on the way. And this is then also a nice way how we actually loop, uh, use the particle very often. If we have a triple property, in this case, we can use like how to react monitoring. So we use an MS1, we can select one mass here, the green uh, circles. In the second particle, which is a collision induced association trap, we can already um, tell, we can already uh, fragment the, the round green things. And then in the MS2, again, we can set it to a specific after charge ratio what we want to track. And the example here is like this, the, the smaller wrong thing and then based on this we can actually use this for quantification it's very nice and there's something to highlight here and then of course if you want to use multiple reactions you need to run it like every time new run so here in this case you would have to have like three runs for example and then you can use like two other masses in the ms2 scan for as a qualifier to see if the ratio is still the same and if everything was correct on the fly. So it's very nice here in this case to so use three, for example, um, reactions and then use this as one quantifier and uh, two as a qualifier in this case. And then another thing what you can also do, of course, is you have here in this case an ion trap. So you can not only select like one um, one chart or one mass of flat ratio, but you can actually scan like the whole range of, of ions, which is also very important to you know. So the next thing is when we have the particle, and now we can also use the time of flight mass analyzer. So here we actually guide the ions through this path here. Then we stop them a bit, and then we accelerate them all together as a bundle into the time of flight. And yeah, fly thing here, the tube. And then in the end, we can separate the ions based on their uh, flying time. So this is shown here. So if you have this one, we combine them or we stop them to have the same starting energy kind of. And then we see that the, the smaller ions are actually faster than the bigger ones. And then this is how we get the mass vector out of it. And again, if something is more abundant, of course, that means that we have more ions in this case. And this is also nicely shown in our mass scan in the end. So this is for the top instruments. And if we go to the Fourier transform instrument, so we have the orbit map on the left side and the ion signature resonance natural function on the right side. These are very specific types of instruments. So we see here, I don't want to go too many too much into detail, but we actually detect all ions at the same time based on this green signal. So the ions are moving in this direction, of, for example, in the orbit trap. And then giving a counter current, and then based on this, there's some uh, calculations from the computer, and then we get the mass vector out of it. So we actually see how many processing is already behind those things. So this is also something you always need to be aware of. when you see raw data, they are of course not any raw anymore because you have already some computational algorithm that optimizing in this step as well. So this is the whole setup. So we have our column, the eyes are entering the C trap and then going into the orbit trap. And then you see we have like the uh, uh, spinning around this way, but this is the most important part from the left to the right, which is then giving us the counter current. And then we get our mass spectrum, our mass scan out of it. And speaking about the C trap, I already started what you need to be aware of. If, if you think we have like a small space and we put all ions into it, we will have a big problem because we will have a problem. And I mean, this is like we shown in this video. And I know that Daniel, for example, like this video a lot <laughs> because it's also highlighting what is actually the problem. So if you have 
iron and we try to get it into this little space thing, we see, of course, it will not work because it will be over full. It's, yeah, we will have space charge effects. So the ions will interact with each other, the accuracy you will lose. We even had it in our system that we could separate two very narrow ions. But if we injected more of this, then we had like the yeah, big problem that in the end it was like one middle mark because everything was uh, interacting with each other. And that is why we have the C trip, which is then actually checking how many ions are actually entering. So you can set it in your mist in your method, which is with automatic gain control. And based on this setting, it's like checking, okay, now I'm full and I will send the package to the Orbi trap and I will do the um, do the analysis, which is very important. Something else you can set, so I think also Daniel maybe will cover it later. If if you have you have this automatic gain control, but if you will not reach it, you also set a limited time because otherwise it will run forever, wait forever. But you can also set a time and say, okay, you either reach this target or the maximum injection time, and then you're good to go. If you're not waiting forever, so you can um, acquire the next scan. And also in an um, orbit travel course, we can do uh, fragmentation experiments, which is only possible like in a targeted way if you have a protocol before, what we already talked before. So here we can set a specific mass to charge ratio, what we actually want to have. And then based on this, we have like a mass that we know, and then we uh, can acquire fragmentation data. If you think about this, is was maybe for a Q executive. If you think about an executive, there's no Q in the name, so we only had the orbit trap. So there was no mass selection before, so you actually fragment everything on the same time. And then of course you need to go back and know, okay, what might be my precursor in this one? It's then comparable to GC. So you basically fragment everything on the same goal. And with this, you can set, okay, I want to fragment this iron or this mass range. And then um, you have an idea what is your precursor iron. Speaking about this, so what are we actually doing in fragmentation experiments? I already talked about in this multiple reaction monitoring or in the uh, precursor ion or product ion scan. So, what does actually mean is if we have the protocol before, so we can select an ion, in this case, this uh, blue greenish uh, bubble here, then we have some energy we put on the molecules to get it in smaller fragment pieces to get more information about the substrate itself. And then we can analyze those uh, those fragment patterns in the end. And again, if we see like the uh, abundance again says something about the, the, yeah, the stability of this ion, for example. So if we see something like this, this means that then the fragment is more stable than maybe some smaller ions. And then of course, if you use higher energy, maybe you shift it to some other smaller masses, maybe you lose some of the higher because then you also break this one into uh, smaller pieces. And then with this information, we actually know more about the structure. So if you think about it, we only have the mass to charge ratio, the isotope pattern, we know already something about the structure. But if you want to know really more about the structure, this fragmentation pattern is really important. So here you get like smaller pieces of the structure, and then you know, okay, this part can only be because of this uh, specific structure, and then you put everything together in, uh, in a way that it makes sense. And this is also something I want to highlight with the annotation uh, confidence. We still have a problem that there's no real standardization for the um, annotation rate. And this is something that was like published and is kind of used in the whole, um, not, not the whole metabolomics community, but at least the bigger group uses it. But for example, the environmental part, they have already like level five. So, and there's also something which level would you, would you actually, uh, yeah, state, right? I mean, level one is always you have the highest level, you have the reference standard. You run it any, on your system, the same setting. So you have the retention time, you have the fragmentation pattern. And this is then when you say it's like a level one annotation. Level two is if you don't have the reference standard, so you can do the matching, which I think is most of the time the cases because you will not have a standard for everything. So you use then level two, you get like an annotation based on this library matching. But something here I also want to highlight just because it's a match, it doesn't mean it's your compound. So it's also something you really need to check and be aware, even it's pretty similar to fragmentation pattern. Does this make any sense? So is the compound really in my sample? So if you have like a plant sample or some natural sample, and then you have some synthetic compound in it, is it really the compound in it, or is it just something that might fragment similar to something you need to really check and not just say, okay, I have a very nice match, I have a high equivalent similarity, and this is my compound that I will have. So always check your data, does it make sense? And very and maybe verify it in another way as well. Then we have like the levels that are less 
yeah, you, you don't really know what it is. So in level three, for example, you get like a formula and maybe the molecular class, so you at least know which uh, yeah, which group it belongs to. And then with level four, it's like the lowest, you know the retention time, then Z, you know the feature, but you don't know what it actually is in the end. And just to know that this is something you need to know if you if you paper if you publish a paper, also people know what is your confidence in annotating those compounds, right? I mean it's always easy to say, oh, I annotated I don't know, 50 percent of my of my sample, but is it really annotated or even identified? So even with identified and annotated, you need to be very careful if you identified it very, I know what it is, and annotated. Yeah, it might be this, but I'm still like not hundred percent sure. And uh, speaking about like fragmentation patterns, so I talked about MS2, but there's also the way that you don't need to stop at MS2, for example. So if you want to get more substructure information, because if you think we fragment some like easily compounds most of the time in the fragmentation pattern, you will lose the glucoside, and this is the main signal in the end in your fragmentation pattern. So it's not very rich, you don't know a lot, you know, maybe there's a glucoside, and then you know something about this, the agriculture. But this is something that you can then use if you have like an iron trap. So then we can actually do multi-step fragmentation. So we don't stay on your MS2. So we have like the MS1 scan, we search for the highest signal maybe, we fragment it, but then we can do the same again. So we can use in the MS2 scan the highest signal and fragment this further and further. Of course, there's also limitation because each time you fragment, you lose iron, so you lose intensity. Of course, with limitation, even the provider or the vendor even says, oh, our system can go to MS8, 9. Yeah, maybe you can, but maybe then the fragmentation pattern looks very weak. You have only noise maybe in the end. So this is something else you can be aware of. And this is how a spectrometry can then look like. So this is just a very easy example. We have MS1 data. We pick like this mark. And then based on this fragmentation pattern in MS2, we then take these three signals, for example, for MS3, and then based on their fragmentation pattern, again, the higher signal. Of course, you will have sometimes redundancy, what you can see here, of course, because in the end, you see only the, the fragment signals that have the charge in the end, right? So everything else, if you have a neutral loss, it's gone, so we will not see. And this is why, of course, with the substructure part, we are kind of limited to a specific, yeah, to a specific part, so you can only see the stuff that is then keep the charge and that you can see the end. And this is also something you need to keep in mind if you apply a data in positive or negative mode. Maybe you see some fragments only negative mode because the charge of the minus remains on the other part, like we have, for example, lipids. And yeah, this is something also we yeah check positive and negative spin as well. And now we talked a lot about fragmentation pattern, but how does it actually work? And I will give this part to Daniel.